All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I was sitting home last Saturday night and got a phone call from my daughter. She was in a class at Kent all day. She had a Saturday class, so she's up there until about 5 o'clock. And whenever I get a call from her at that time of night, I know it's not going to be a good thing. And I answer the phone and she said, Dad, my battery won't, my car won't start. The battery's dead. I'll we'll find somebody around there can jump before when everybody's gone. Uh, student services are closed. Uh, there's nobody here except me sitting in this parking lot by myself. So what am I going to do? So we got arranged. We found somebody to jump her battery for her. She got home on time. But I guess I wonder when you find yourself in difficult situations like that, what do you do? How do you respond to those things? But what do you do when you find yourself in dealing with some kind of a difficult circumstance, whether it be a dead battery, we've all been there, or something a little more serious, something a little more uh, painful to you? How do you respond? Uh, the natural reaction for most people is to resist those things. We avoid those things if we can. We don't like to be in those kind of situations. We try to find a way around them, uh, try to end those things as quickly as possible. Uh, and if we can't do any of those things, what we might le at least do is complain about it. <laughs> Talk to somebody about it, tell them how bad things are, and try to find some sympathy from somebody who will you know, feel bad for us and feel bad with us as we're going through this difficult burden, whatever that might be that we had to carry. That's another indication of how far our thoughts are from God's thoughts. How different we think from how God thinks. It's an indication of how different our perspective is from God's perspective. Because under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, Paul's direction to us in those times is not to avoid those circumstances, not to complain about them, not to bemoan our misfortune. Rather, look at verse 17 again. God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called everyone, so let him walk. Whatever God has called you to, Paul says, whatever that might be, walk in those circumstances. Accept the circumstances, accept the situation, allow it to be whatever it is, and let God have his glory through it. Allow God to do what he wants to in those circumstances. Let God do his work through that circumstance. Verse 22, For he that is called in the Lord being a servant is the Lord's free man. Likewise also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. He says there, whatever you are called to, you are called to it in the Lord. In the Lord. That means nothing happens in your life outside of the will of God. That means if you are in the Lord this morning, every event that occurs in your life happens while you are in the Lord. You can't get out of the Lord. Once you're there, you're there permanently. That means God has a plan for every circumstance. God has a plan for every situation, even if our choices at times put us in places that are totally opposed to where God wants us. Even in those places, God has a plan. And so wherever you are at, whatever you are dealing with, look at verse 24, Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. No matter where you find yourself, abide there because God is there with you. And God handles that situation. God will walk through that situation with you. So as much as it goes against our nature, as much as it goes against man's advice and man's wisdom, God says, abide in the circumstances where God has placed you, whatever that might be. Rest in that place. Accept that for what it is. Do all you can to make sure God is getting the glory for wherever you are and whatever circumstance is occurring. Now, those, the context of these comments that Paul is making here is the context of marriage and singleness. And so God is saying, if you're married, uh, do your best in that marriage to bring glory to God. If you're single, use your singleness as a way to bring glory to God. No matter what is, such circumstance you're in, find a way to bring glory to God in that circumstance. Don't wish that things were different, different and spend all your time there. Use that situation so that it will have eternal consequences, so that somehow God will get glory. No matter how difficult things may become, God will still get the glory from it. So in other words, in the context here, don't rush your marital status. Instead, let God work through the situation that you might be in. And then look at verse 25. He says, Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment, as one that has obtained mercy of the Lord, to be faithful. Now he's going to begin to address those who have never been married. And he says again, as he said twice now, the things that I'm going to say to you, God did not command me to say. God has given me permission to say these things, and because God has given me permission to say them, I'm going to say them. And what that means is, God has allowed Paul to give his judgment on these issues. And because Paul says what is faithful to what God would say, God allows it to become part of Scripture. So one more time, if God allowed it in his word, it's part of God's word. It's inspired just as much as any other portion of God's word is. It's just as much something we need to take heed to as anything else we might find in Scripture. And so what Paul is going to begin to talk about now is some principles that are relevant to this whole matter of marriage and relationships. And he addresses here in verse 25, he addresses virgins. 
That's somebody who's never had a physical relationship with someone of the opposite sex, and therefore they've never been married. And by the way, please notice, God always places the physical relationship in the context of marriage. God never puts his approval on that relationship outside the boundaries of marriage. No matter what some non-Christian or some Christian might say to you, that is never God's will. A person's lack of self-control does not affect God's standards. God doesn't make allowance for that because we can't handle it. God says what's wrong is wrong, even if times have changed, even if prevailing thought is to the contrary. God still has a standard that he holds to, expects his people to hold to it as well. That's who he's speaking to. He is speaking to those who have never been married. Verse 26, I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that is good for a man so to be. So he speaks first to male virgins, those who are male and single. And Paul's direction there is, if a man is single, it's probably best for him to remain single. Verse 27, Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. Now he addresses those who are married, and he says, if you're married, it's best for you to remain married. I read a quote from Dr. Bob Jones Sr. He said, I've been married to the same woman for 45 years. I've never felt like leaving her, although I've often felt like choking her to death. <laughs> Well, hopefully that's not where you're at in your marriage this morning. But Paul's direction is, once you're married, stay married without choking her to death. Stay married. Then Paul says in that same verse, if a man is divorced, it's best that he remain single. He should not seek a wife. What if he does? What if he chooses to re not remain single and marries again after being loosed from a wife? Verse 28, but and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such will have trouble in the flesh but I spare you. Paul says, if you do choose to get married after being separated from a wife or a husband, you have not sinned if you do that. He does say you're going to have difficulty in the flesh as a result of that choice, which is why Paul's primary suggestion is, once you're out of a marriage, it's best for you to stay out of, that mar out of a marriage. Now, I'm going to stop here, and for a few minutes, I'm going to address this whole matter of marriage and divorce and remarriage. And I'm doing that because there are a lot of ideas floating around out there from Christian circles and from Christian people that I don't believe are necessarily biblical thought. And therefore, I would like to go through this as biblically as I possibly can. And I realize that I'm walking in a territory where angels fear to tread. <laughs> I realize it's a very sensitive topic for many people. I realize many of you have been affected by divorce, either personally or a family member or somebody else. I also realize many of you have not been affected by that. So what I'm going to try and do this morning is first of all tell you I'm not divorced, never have been. And therefore I am talking about something that has never directly affected me. That's why I'm going to stick strictly to what the Bible says about it. I'm going to avoid the best I can giving any personal opinion about something I've never had any experience with, personally. And you may not agree with everything I say here this morning. I would ask that all you do is listen to what the Word of God says and that if you disagree with me, disagree on biblical grounds. Find verses of Scripture that are contrary to what I've said, and please come, let's talk about it. I'm always willing to do that if you find something that you disagree with from the, the things we talk about here. I would ask, which is very difficult sometimes, that we not base what we think on our own personal opinion. That everything we think about, whatever the topic is, we always go to the Word of God to find out what God's Word says, instead of basing on what we think, or what somebody else says that, we think, that they think, somebody we know or admire, what they think about the topic. What I want to know this morning is what does God say about this whole matter of divorce and remarriage? And I want to start with you this morning by going to Deuteronomy chapter 24. So hold your place there in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and go to Deuteronomy chapter 24. And by doing this, we're going to get the context of this whole topic. Because this is the first time it is mentioned in Scripture. It's actually mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy. So to get the full picture, we've got to get it from the all Scripture that, that uh, talks about it. Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. But if the latter husband hate her, and write her a bill of divorcement, and giveth it in her hand, and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife after that she is defiled. For that is abomination before the Lord, and thou shalt not cause a land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. Okay, 
What is, this is the law that God gave to Moses, and this is Moses presenting the law to the people. And what he says here is, if a man finds something in his wife that he doesn't like, some uncleanness that he finds in her, whatever that might be, and notice there's no clarification to that, it simply says, if it comes to pass, he find, she finds doesn't find favor in his eyes, he finds some uncleanness in her, he is permitted on that basis to divorce her. Any basis. So for whatever reason, if he decides he no longer likes his wife, for whatever reason that might be, he can divorce her. Sounds like the 21st century. And notice he says, if that happens in verse 2, that woman who has been divorced is able to marry somebody else. She is permitted to go out of that house and find whoever she might find and become that man's wife. Notice verse 4. If the man who she married to then also divorced her and sends her out of his house, that man who first divorced her can't go back and marry her again. So the first husband is no longer permitted to marry her again if she becomes divorced or if her second husband dies. Moses, Moses says there, that's an abomination in the Old Testament law. So the Old Testament, verse chapter 24 of Deuteronomy, for whatever reason, if a man finds something in his wife he doesn't like, he can send her out, she can be divorced, she can marry somebody else, but that man who sends her out cannot marry her again. Now go to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. Because you see, the Pharisees knew the Old Testament law. They were trained in the Old Testament law. So when Jesus Christ shows up, one of the questions they have to ask him is, what about this Old Testament law regarding divorce? What do you think about that? Getting Jesus Christ's ideas about divorce connected to the Old Testament law. Verse 3, Matthew chapter 19. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Why do they ask that? They ask that because Deuteronomy chapter 4, that's exactly what the reason, that's what, exactly what the law said. They could divorce a wife for any cause. Verse 4. And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement, and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except to be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is good not to marry. What's Christ saying? Christ says when God designed the family, he put people together with the idea that they should never part. And the reason that he did that, the reason why the permission was given for the divorce in the Old Testament, was because of the hardness of the hearts of the people that Moses was dealing with. Those hard hearts are the people he was addressing. God made an accommodation for those hard hearts. In other words, the divorce rules in the Old Testament were God's permissive will, not God's direct will. We're going to talk about that concept a whole lot more in just a few minutes. But in this case, God made allowances for divorce because of man's inability to follow God's original directive. The original directive, the direct will of God, is illustrated in the garden. And that's what Jesus Christ talks about here in verse 5 and verse 4. He says when God made them, he made them male and female. He put them together. A man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife, and they are no more twain. They're now one. And that's the way God, Jesus Christ said it should always be. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. God's direct will is that a man and a woman come together, and they never part. So now Jesus Christ has given a new standard regarding divorce. He says that there's only one grounds for divorce, and that's fornication. Jesus Christ says in the old times there was all kinds of reasons. Now there's one, and the reason is fornication. That's God's direct will. A man could no longer end a marriage for every cause. The only reason God gives for divorce in this passage is sexual unfaithfulness. This is one of the few places in Scripture where the New Testament is actually more stringent than the Old Testament is. Now, why would that be? Why is Jesus Christ putting more restrictions on marriage than what was happening in the Old Testament? We've talked about this before. I'll review it with you very quickly. In the New Testament, marriage takes on a whole different picture. And there's a significance of marriage in the New Testament that was not there in the Old Testament, Ephesians chapter 6. Marriage now represents what? Christ and His church. 
It's now representing the bond between Jesus Christ and a believer. And marriage now is the picture of the bond that exists between Jesus Christ and his bride, and therefore the, the grounds for divorce are reduced. So that nobody can miss the picture that God has put something together that he never wants to part. What's the picture? The picture of Jesus Christ and his church. There is now a lasting union that exists between Jesus Christ and his bride. And so the grounds to end that union, because of the significance of the picture, are greatly reduced as a result of that. No longer is it for every cause. So, from Matthew 19, we find this. Unfaithfulness, sexual unfaithfulness, is a clear grounds for a marriage to end, according to Jesus Christ's words. What else is a biblical, acceptable reason to end a marriage? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Back to where you were a few minutes ago. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Look at verse 39. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 39. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. Here is the second reason. Very obviously, death is a reason for remarriage. That's also reinforced to us in Romans chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. If a death occurs, the spouse is now free from the bond of that marriage relationship, and she is now permitted to marry somebody else, or he is permitted to marry somebody else. The third reason to end a marriage is what we talked about last week, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 again. If a person is married to an unbeliever, and the unbeliever chooses to leave that relationship, the believer who is left is now freed from that relationship and is permitted to marry again. That is specifically targeted, hear me now, specifically targeted to a believer and an unbeliever in a marriage together. The Word of God assumes that two believers will stay together and not leave each other. And therefore, God never addresses that specifically in the Word of God. So, after studying God's Word, those are the only three legitimate biblical reasons I can find where divorce is acceptable from the Word of God. Fornication, death, or an unbeliever leaving a believer. Those three reasons are the only reasons in God's direct will that a person can leave their spouse and be remarried to somebody else. Now, I'm well aware, especially because of the work I do, there are many, many other things going on in marriages. I see it more and more every day. When I started this work many, many years ago, as of what I'm doing now, I've been amazed at the new things come in to try and destroy marriages, to get into marriages and disrupt them. I realize there's physical abuse. I realize there's mental abuse. I realize there's mo emotional abuse. I realize there's involvement with pornography and internet relationships, alcoholism and drug use, and on and on we could go. All kinds of things get in the way of two people being married to each other. And those are horrible things. And they put a tremendous strain on a marriage, and especially on the one who is the victim of those behaviors. Again, I work with it every day. I see how it goes. So I know what that's all about. Is it okay to end a marriage because of those things? If those things are occurring in a marriage, is it okay to end the marriage because of those things? Or what happens if a saved person leaves the marriage? They choose to go out and they leave the other saved spouse behind. Is it okay for that spouse that is left in that situation to end the relationship and move on to somebody else? I'm going to say much more about this in a minute. But let me start out by saying this. There are three biblical grounds for divorce. Fornication, death, and desertion by an unbelieving spouse. And if any of the other things that I just mentioned to you fit into one of those three categories, then you have a clear biblical ground to end your marriage. And if they don't fit into one of those three categories, we do not have a clear biblical ground to end that marriage. And in those cases, it becomes of utmost importance that the person in that marriage seeks God's face in prayer, intensely examines the Word of God to determine what course of action they should take with those kinds of things going on. But I'm going to say this, and I'm going to be very careful when I say this, because I understand the gravity of the situation. If there is not fornication, or death, or desertion by an unbelieving partner, divorce should not be the first response in any other situation. It should not be the first response. And I say that only because any other situation does not meet the clear criteria God has given for divorce. So if a person is in that kind of a situation, there's, the, there's alcoholism going on, there's pornography going on, uh, there's other things going on, mental abuse, verbal abuse, uh, physical abuse going on in that relationship, what should that person do? Well, if after careful, consistent, heartfelt prayer, after carefully studying the Word of God, and they feel divorce is the only choice they have, and they need to end that marriage, I would not argue with them about that. It's not my place to argue with them about that. I am not the judge in those situations. By the way, neither are you. 
and neither is any other preacher or teacher or pastor. That is between the believer and God Himself. That's who works it out between the two. It's between them. It's not my place nor your place. That's a decision between them and the leading of the Spirit of God. The only advice I would give in a situation like that is make sure the choice you make is how God is leading. And make sure that everything else has been done prior to that to try to remedy that situation. And if it simply seems there is no other choice, that they must, then they must do whatever they see best to do. Now the only reason I'm hedging about this is because I have dealt with people who are looking for any reason in the world to get divorced. <laughs> Uh, most people, well, I shouldn't say most, many people who come into my office are coming to my office to finish counseling off before they get divorced. It's like they, they go through that step, it still didn't work, so now they can, they're, they're free to, to leave that marriage. Uh, people are looking for reasons to get out of marriage. Many people are. So when an opportunity presents itself, rather than seeking God's plan in that situation, rather than seeing what God would have them to do, or my desire for them to do in that situation, they immediately get out using a bad situation as the reason for the choice they made. Folks, let me tell you something, and you know this, but we'll just say it. You know for the Word of God, God is all about reconciliation. That's what God's about. That is God's first choice every time. Now, I'm not saying it's always possible. A God died to reconcile the world. Not all the world is going to be reconciled. They make other choices. But that is God's primary objective, and that should also be our primary objective. Now, it may not be possible. I'm, I understand that. What I'm saying is reconciliation is the first step. And so we don't look for other opportunities, uh, other choices, until that choice has been fully examined and fully pursued. And if it doesn't work, then we need to move on to whatever God leads us to do. But I will say this, generally speaking, whatever difficult situation we find ourselves in, God always wants to do something in that situation to teach us and draw us closer to Him. That's why I mentioned to you at the outset, what do you do in difficult situations? Do you run from them? Or do you seek to find God's will in them? Whatever difficult situation we find ourselves in, all things work together for good to them that love God, even bad marriages. Even bad marriages. And if we leave a situation too quickly, whatever that might be, we may lose what it is God wants us to learn from that situation. So, again, one more time. Three biblical reasons to end marriage. Those three I just gave you. Everything else must be thoroughly bathed in prayer, must be thoroughly bathed in a study and a clear seeking of God's Word, Every other situation to be in God's will, we must seek to find out what He wants us to learn. We must seek honestly, find ways that He wants us to deal with that situation. And we should make no decision until we have definite peace that the decision we are making is the decision He wants us to make. And again, that's true if we're talking about bad marriages or if we're talking about anything else. The principle is the same. Before we do anything, seek God's clear direction, seek God's will, and make sure you've got a peace about the decision you're making. And then if you have a peace about it, nobody can argue that situation with you. So, let me ask you this question. When is it okay for a saved, divorced person to remarry? Is it ever okay for a saved, divorced person to remarry? If a person has been divorced based on biblical grounds, clear biblical grounds from God's Word, can he or she remarry again? 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 27. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loose. Art thou loose from a wife? Seek not a wife. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. I mentioned to you a minute ago, God has two wills. You find that in, in Romans chapter 12. God has two wills. God has a direct will, and God has a permissive will. What is God's direct will? God's direct will is His perfect will. It's His perfect will. It's exactly what God wants to see happen. It's the exact place God wants to find each one of us. Doing the exact thing God wants us to do in the exact place where God wants us to do it. That is God's direct will. But then God also has His permissive will. That is His second choice. And He will, he will allow us to do certain things or be at certain places in our lives and He'll bless us in those places even though it's not the first place, choice for us to be. It's not God's first choice for us, but God will bless us in those places even though He'd rather have us in His direct will. In verses 27 and 28 of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you have both of God's wills mentioned to you. What's God's direct will? Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loose. God's direct will. If you're married, stay married. And don't seek to be loose from your marriage. God's direct will. Art thou loose from a wife? Seek not a wife. 
if you're separated from a marriage, if you're no longer in a marriage, don't seek to be remarried again. Don't seek remarriage if you're out of a marriage. There is God's direct will. There is God's perfect plan. What he says there is, those who are married should not divorce. They should do everything in their power to make that marriage work. They should accept some things that are not going to be the way they want them to be in that marriage, and they should never give up on that marriage. And if the marriage doesn't work, and they do have to divorce, they should not seek to be married again. That is God's direct will. They should accept the fact that being single is where now God now wants them. They should resign themselves to that. That is the perfect will of God. So if you want all the blessings God has for you, if you want to be in His direct will and have all of His blessing, no matter what that may mean, no matter what consequences brings you, then what that means is stay in God's direct will. Do what God wants you to do in His direct will. Verse 28. God's permissive will. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. If a person chooses to remarry after getting out of a marriage for biblical grounds, they've not sinned. The only stipulation is found there in verse 39. Again, turn to verse 39 if you would. It says, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will. Next four words, only in the Lord. God never, ever, ever expects a believer to marry or to be with an unbeliever. God never allows that in Scripture. Now, people do it, but God never makes allowances for that. God says every relationship you have, as far as marriage relationship, or, or that kind of a relationship, should be between a believer and a believer. You have no sense whatsoever, no right whatsoever, to involve yourself with an unbeliever in that context. God makes no allowance for it. So I don't care what they're saying out there about it. I don't care what you've heard about it or how people have convinced themselves about it. That is not God's will. It's not God's will. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you. Appreciate that. Now go back to verse 28. God's permissive will. If thou marry, thou hast not sinned. Marry in the Lord, but understand when you make that choice, you are not in God's direct will. You are in God's permissive will. And because of that, Paul puts the caveat at the end, uh, verse 28 again, Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. So if you make that choice, because you are in God's permissive will and not God's direct will, the flesh is going to give you some trouble. You will have, you will have to think some things to deal with you would not have to deal with if you stayed single. You've not sinned if you're married, but realize there's going to be some consequences to it because you made that choice. You're going to have to deal some, with some things that the flesh is going to present to you. Now, some of you could speak to this much better than I could. Many of you could speak to this much better than I could. But I've dealt with couples who have been remarried. And I've gained in almost every couple I've talked to, it's not been an easy process. There's been some difficulty along the way. Not that they haven't navigated through it. Not that they haven't done the best with it. But there's been some difficulty as a result of that process. I'm sure there are exceptions to that. But in most remarriages I've dealt with, there are consequences from the first marriage. There are wounds and issues that are brought along because of the first relationship. And those things tend to interfere and cause difficulty in that second marriage. Again, not that it's not workable, but it's something more to deal with as a result. And that's because it is not God's direct will. And any time I step out of God's direct will, things will not go as smoothly as they would if I stayed in God's direct will. Now realize I can still operate in God's permissive will. I am allowed to do that. But I do invite some other things into my life as a result. So, Paul says, if you choose to remarry, understand there are going to be consequences to that. Expect some trouble in the flesh as a result of that. Expect there's going to be some difficulties that you would not have to deal with had you stayed single. Don't walk in believing that second marriage is going to be a cakewalk because more than likely it's not going to be. But please hear Paul's words. I'm going to give them to you one more time in verse 28. If thou marry, thou hast not sinned. Now see it. Because out there, among Christian circles, there are many, many people saying that if a person who has been divorced for legal, biblical grounds remarries, that's sin. Folks, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says it's not sin. It's permitted. It's allowed. That's what it says. The Word of God says... If you choose to do that, God will bless you for that. He says it's better for you to stay married. It's better for you to stay single if you're divorced. But if you remarry, you have not sinned. Now, I think it's different. In fact, I know it's different if you've divorced as a saved person for grounds that aren't biblical. I think that's a whole different situation. Uh, you realize, of course, divorce for a lost person doesn't count at all. 
because God doesn't recognize the marriage of a lost person, and therefore whatever that lost person does, whatever it is, until they trust Jesus Christ as Savior, God doesn't see anything they do. It's all sin to God. But to the saved, Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 19, if you divorce for a non-biblical reason and marry somebody else, you are now living in adultery. Why is that? Because if the grounds aren't biblical, God does not recognize the divorce. You might recognize it. The state might recognize it. God doesn't recognize it. If you've been divorced for non-biblical grounds, not grounds that are specifically given to us in the Word of God, that divorce does not count in God's eyes. In God's eyes, you're still married to that person. And so if you go out and physically connect yourself with somebody else, remember, to God, marriage is a physical act between two people. If you physically involve yourself with somebody else, you now have two spouses. You've got the one that you think you divorced, and you've also got the one you're married to now. And Jesus Christ says, that's adultery. So remarriage after ending a marriage on non-biblical grounds is sin. And each believer must allow God on his own to lead them and help them to determine if the grounds for leaving that marriage is biblical or not. That is between you and the Lord. I have nothing to say about that whatsoever. Now, I can say a whole lot more about this, and we're going to deal a little bit more with this in the upcoming weeks, but let me conclude this morning by giving you three, three final comments. First of all, I'll say it one more time. Divorce based upon non-biblical grounds is sin. If a person divorces, and it's not for one of the three reasons I mentioned to you, it's sin. Now, not to minimize it, but let me be clear about something. Gossip is also sin. <laughs> Anger without a cause is also sin. Not tithing is a sin. Lying is a sin. What do we do when we sin? We repent of it. We sorrow with godly sorrow over the sin we've committed. We forsake that sin. We accept there's going to be consequences that may remain in our lives because of that sin. And we deal with those consequences and we move on. That's what we always do with sin, no matter what the sin is. 1 John 1, 9, confess it, he forgives it. Confess it, he forgives it. And that does not apply to every sin except a non-biblical divorce or a non-biblical remarriage. It applies to all sin. You know, let me jump on my hobby horse just for a second here, okay? We've got this the religion out there that says there's two kinds of sins. There's a religion out there that says there's venial sins, which are sins that God does forgive. And then there's mortal sins, the sins that God does not forgive. And most of us who are Bible believers in this church would resist that teaching. You should, because it's not biblical. We resist that teaching. What we say is, all sin is sin, and God forgives all sin. Except when it comes to divorce. Then we've got a problem with that one. We've got a mortal sin in the, Christian circle, in the Baptist circles. The mortal sin is divorce. And as long as you're not doing it, as long as you're sinning any other way, we're okay with that. <laughs> Go ahead and sin like that. Just confess and get it settled. But if you're divorced, I don't think God forgives that one. Find that in Scripture for me, would you? I'd love to see it. Please, after the service, come to me and find me a verse that says, God does not forgive the sin of divorce. Find it for me? <laughs> I can't find it. You may find it. Maybe you've got a different version than I've got. You better not. <laughs> <laughs> when I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior, He took care of all sin. Past, present, and future. Because you see, when Christ died on the cross, all my sin was future sin. I ain't not even born yet. So all my sin is future sin. And therefore, all my sin is covered by the cross. When I took the work of the Lord Jesus Christ as my work, when I asked forgiveness for my sin and accepted his salvation, all my sin was covered at that moment. It's all forgiven. Now, as I say that, I don't want to minimize the effects that divorce can have. Testimonies are affected by divorce. Your ability to serve in certain places in the church might be affected by divorce. The picture of Christ and his church is harmed by divorce. I get all that. There are consequences to that sin, to that divorce that we can't gloss over. But once you have that settled, once that sin is truly forgessed, for, confessed, and forsaken, life moves on because God forgives sin. God forgives sin. God's work on the cross, God's work continues through you, and God can use you in his work because sin is settled. The only way God cannot use a believer in this church is if you've got sin in your life that's not confessed. But if you've got sin in your life that is confessed, then God's forgotten that sin. It's already settled. He's cast it aside. I'm not minimizing. I'm simply saying to you, all sin is sin, and God forgives all sin, no matter what it might be. And I know some divorced folks who God has used in marvelous ways after the divorce. I know some folks that God has used in great ways after the divorce, after they got to settle with God, after they, they and God got together and worked that thing through. 
Now, could God have used them in greater ways? Have there not been a divorce? I believe that's probably the case. But God is in the habit of using damaged people because all of us come to Christ with some kind of damage. Amen. And just because it's not divorce doesn't mean it's any less than any other kind of damage. We all come with something. And God uses us in spite of that damage. God uses, so uses us in spite of the difficulties and the character flaws and so forth. So God uses all of us if we're willing to be used. Here's my second point. If you've remarried after divorcing for a non-biblical reason, and you are now aware the reason that you divorced was not right, approach it the same way that I talked to you about just a minute ago. Confess it as sin. Show genuine sorrow for that sin, for the choices you've made. Understand there's going to be consequences in some form or another because of the choice you made and move on the best way you can and serve God in whatever opportunities God gives you to serve Him. Now again, in that case, your work for the Lord may be more limited, but God can use you and God will use you if your heart is right, if your repentance is genuine, and if you understand some limitations that might occur because of that choice. But once you got all that and you settled it between you and the Lord, move on and begin serving God however you can. Number three, if your marriage dissolved on biblical grounds and you then remarry in the Lord, despite of what you have heard, that is not sin and God can use that marriage. Divorce is not the mortal sin of the church, folks. It is not. If you have been divorced for biblical grounds and you remarry somebody in the Lord, God will bless that marriage and you have not sinned as a result of making that choice. Now again, Paul says, verse 28, there's going to be trouble in the flesh. There are going to be some difficulties because of that, but aside from that, that is not sin, and God can use you. And here's what I see in all this, and here's the lesson for all of us to learn today, whether you're divorced or not. God uses willing hearts. That's what God uses. God uses people who are willing to be used. God will even use people who aren't willing to be used sometimes. We look at Balaam and so forth. But if you're willing to be used, God can use you. I don't care what kind of sin is in your past. When I was growing up in church, I should get up. When I was growing up in church, we'd have these fellows come through, these evangelists come through. And in the old days, you know, they were very proud of their old sins. <laughs> they tell you about all the stuff they used to get involved in, you know, all the drugs and all this stuff. I mean, they've been a great deep. I, I think somebody got glory in the old sins. And they would present like, you know, message after message talking about the old sins they were involved in and they tell how Jesus Christ saved them. And every time those guys came through, it was like this glorious thing that was going on. These men had, had, you know, had all this stuff going on in their lives and all this horrible sin had gone on in their lives and God had saved them from all that stuff and, and now they're off, you know, serving God. And some of these fellows have been saved for a while and they got back to and got into all this kind of sin and they talked about all that sin and talked about how they came back to the Lord and confessed all that sin to Him, how He forgave them for all that and everybody rejoiced in all that. But I guarantee you, if a fellow come up to that pulpit and said, I got divorced, and God used me in spite of it, I better better hush in that crowd. Because for some reason, that sin doesn't count, like the other sins do. <laughs> God uses willing hearts, folks, no matter what the sin. If you've got to confess and forsaken, and you're right with the Lord, and you and he are on the same path, and on the same wavelength, God can use you. God can use you. Now again, maybe not like he could have used you had the divorce not occurred, but that's something that's under the bridge now. Can't do anything about that. If you have confessed it and forsaken it and shown godly sorrow for it, God will use you if your heart is willing to be used. God will use you. Maybe you're in a marriage you don't want to be in. Paul says, unless you can't, stay in it. And God will use you in that marriage. You say, I'm single, and I'd like to be married, I'm hoping to be married, but I'm not married yet, and I'm frustrated by that. Listen to me, stay satisfied where God has put you, and God can use you. God can use you. Just because you're married doesn't mean God can use you better. As some single people, God uses it in great ways. What Paul says is, whatever your status, married or single, if you want to be used, surrender yourself to Him, and God can and will use you. Now, He'll use us differently. He has some work that he'll do, have me to do. He won't have you to do. And sometimes because of sinful choices we make, God has to work around some of the consequences of those choices. But regardless of that, if you want to be used by God, God will use you. Never let past choices affect what you do for him now. Get it settled. Confess it. Forsake it. The Bible says God forgets it. God forgets it. Now you may not forget it, and the people around you may have trouble forgetting it. God's already forgotten it. 
The minute it's confessed and forsaken, God sets it aside. So I'll say this to you, no matter what your past, divorce, remarriage, some other sin, whatever it might be, no matter what your past, submit that past to Him, give Him complete control over your life with all that you have, make yourself available to Him. That's all God wants. Just wants a group of available people. And if we will do that and let Him do the rest, God will use us in marvelous ways. But it takes a willing heart to make that happen. Heads bowed. Eyes closed.